it is true that some preach Christ out of envy, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether in life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Well, welcome. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are honored that you've chosen to start your week off by worshiping with us here at Prescott Christian Church. I want to welcome all of those who are joining us online from whenever and wherever you are. We are so grateful to have you as a part of PCC. If you're a newcomer with us, whether in the room or online, we'd love to know that you're with us today. Uh, You can uh, put your name in the chat or email our office. We'd love to connect with you with you, for those of you who are online. If you're in the room, out in the lobby, off to the right, we have a place we call Pastor's Point. I'll be hanging out there after the service, and we'd love for you to come by and introduce yourself. Well, today we are beginning a brand new sermon series. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn them on or turn them to Philippians chapter 1. If you're new to the Scriptures, they all come with a table of contents, so that's helpful. You can find Philippians there and join us there. If Uh, You have a Bible at home that you typically like to use to highlight or take notes, uh, to study with. I would highly encourage you to start bringing that with you. This series, we're going to actually work our way verse by verse, line by line through the book of first, uh, I'm sorry, of Philippians. So grab that with you. We will put text on the screen, uh, but it's always helpful to have it in your lap so you know that I'm not making stuff up. So Love for you to grab your Bible, bring it with you uh, as we study through this together. Speaking of study, on your chair, you probably saw a book like this. If not, you're sitting on it. You can grab that. That's a study guide that goes with this sermon series. Use it every day. There's something in there for all week. We want you to get the most out of this study of Philippians. So every day there's a little bit of something in there to help get you thinking about the content in the book of Philippians. And there's also uh, some discussion questions that you can use in your life group or in a discipleship group or even if it's just two or three around a lunch table in the break room at work. So whatever that looks like, that's what this is for. Invite you to take Take that with you when you go. Bring it back. There's room for notes in there if you're a note taker. And I would say that today, I know there's some of you and you're like, oh, my neighbor would love this. And my aunt who lives in Spokane, who watches twice a year, this is great for her. Save it until next week. Let's make sure everybody gets one who shows up here today. For those of you who are online, there is a PDF version you can just download. Uh, You can find it on the front page of our website. So that's available for you as well uh, if you want to... Uh, tag along with us in this study. So today we are kicking off this series for Philippians. And what we're going to do today is simply set the context for the book of Philippians. So this for me uh, is one of the most important sermons in the whole series. So I do just need to caution you. So if you get to the end of this thing and you think, well, that just wasn't much of a sermon, that's because this is the introduction. Like this is like the first two pages, okay, of a book. You're not going to get the whole thing. You're just getting the thing started today. But this is a hugely important message because, again, it sets the context. And what I think happens as we begin to understand the context for Philippians is it helps these words on these page go from just simply being disconnected, lifeless, ancient words to an ancient people, and it turns them into powerful, emotional, life-giving, life-changing words for us. And so that's what we're going to try to accomplish today. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go. Philippians chapter 1, we'll start in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus... To all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, 
Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing we need to know about Philippians is that even though we call it a book of the Bible, it's not a book. It's actually a letter. So this is setting up a letter. And the way ancient letters uh, were written is you'd always start by saying who is writing the letter which is Paul and Timothy, although Timothy's not really writing it. We'll get to that in just a minute. But he's with Paul as he's writing this. So you got Paul and Timothy, and they are writing this letter. Um, The year is about 61 AD. Paul is likely on in house arrest in the city of Rome. So again, just trying to put the context all together for us. So imagine Paul on house arrest in Rome. Rome. If you are a Bible student, you may remember in the book of Acts, the back half, the almost the back half of the book of Acts is all about Paul. It's all about his story, about him sharing the gospel in all these different places. And there's a point in the story where Paul gets in trouble in Jerusalem. He gets arrested and they're about to try him uh, falsely and he appeals. And he says, look, I appeal to Caesar. And Paul was a Roman citizen, so he had the right to take his case all the way to Caesar. And that's what he did. So they stuck him on a boat, and they said, well, you want to go see Caesar? Then go see Caesar. They put him on a boat. You may remember the story. He's in the Mediterranean Sea, and he gets shipwrecked, and he's bobbing in the ocean. He he washes up on the island of Malta, and there he's gathering wood, and he gets bit by the viper, and he shakes it off, and everybody thinks he's going to die. You may remember this story. Eventually, he makes it to Rome. And in Rome, uh, he's put in house arrest, awaiting his trial. And this is how the book of Acts ends. It says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with with all boldness and without hindrance. So while he's there in Rome, chained to a guard, on house arrest, what does he have to do? He reads and he writes. In fact, scholars believe that Paul, while he was in this Roman uh, house arrest for two years, he wrote the letter to the Philippians, he wrote the letter to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, and the letter of Philemon. So what else are you going to do? If you're locked up, you just read and write. That's what you do. You got letters, you write them. So that's what he does. And there at the beginning of our text in Philippians, it says, Timothy was with him. He's with him. Again, not that he's a co-author here. But he's there in Rome with Paul, helping to take care of him. um, Because you didn't get three hots and a cot in those prisons. You had to have somebody take care of you. That's what Timothy is doing there in Rome. And it matters that Paul mentions Timothy to the Philippians. Because Timothy had a great connection with this church in Philippi. We'll see that as we go through this letter. So, again, that's who's writing it. Paul, 61 AD, from a Roman house arrest. And who's he writing it to? Well, the text says to to all of God's holy people in Philippi, to the overseers and the deacons. In other words, he's writing to this ecclesia of Philippi, this group, this gathered group of people, this gathered group of people, along with not just the people in the church, but also the overseers, that's the elders and the deacons, to the leadership. He's writing this to everybody in the church of Philippi. So that sets us up. Now we got a little bit of the background, and here's how he begins. I thank my God every time I remember you. So as Paul is sitting there in house arrest, and he's thinking about his life and his ministry and the people he's connected with, Paul says, whenever I think of you people in Philippi, I can't do anything except thank God for you. I thank God for you. As we dive into this letter... I think it would be really helpful for us to remember these people along with Paul. He says, I remember you. Do you remember the people in Philippi? Probably not. But you will after today. Because I think this is what, what we need to know about this letter is that, that, that Paul is thinking about these people in Philippi. It's his memory of these people, him remembering them, that. That's the reason he's writing this thing. He has an intimate relationship with these people. That's the heartbeat of this letter. And I want you to know who he is thinking about. I want you to remember with Paul these people in 
Philippi. So how do we do that? Well, we back up about 10 years and we go back to how the, the church in Philippi began. Now, the good news for us is it's recorded for us right there in your Bible in Acts chapter 16. So let's flip back in your Bible. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. And we're going to go back to Paul showing up in Philippi for the very first time. Because I want you to remember what he's remembering as he is writing this letter. So Acts chapter 16. So chapter 16 in Acts begins with Paul showing up in Asia Minor. And he, the first thing Acts 16 tells us is that he picks up a brand new young protege named Timothy. So Acts 16 is the first time Timothy shows up. Paul takes him under his wing and Timothy begins the, the journey of following Paul and participating in the ministry of Paul, which is why Timothy and Paul are both listed in the letter to the Philippians because Timothy's there with him in Acts Chapter 16. So we're going to pick it up in verse 6 of Acts 16. It says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phygria and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. And so they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. That's a lot of words and a lot of cities and a lot of places that you have no idea of. And chances are, if you're a visual person like me, it might help if I throw up a map. So let me try to help you understand this. So this is the Mediterranean Sea. This is Israel right over here, Jerusalem. Paul began his ministry out of this region right here, out of Antioch. And he heads, the text says, into what's called Asia Minor. So this is Asia right here. What we would call this is modern day Turkey. And so Paul begins his ministry and he's trying to preach the gospel here. In fact, the text says, we tried to go up here to Bithynia to preach the gospel, but the Spirit of God would not let us. We, we wanted to go to Mysia, but, but Jesus stopped us. So we're, we're traveling through, we're wanting to share the gospel here, but, but Jesus says, no, 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 I don't want you to go there. I've got something different for you in mind. So he says, we go down to Troas. So that's right here. So Paul's hanging out here in Troas. Let's keep going. It says, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So again, back to our map. Paul's here in Troas, and he has this vision. And the vision is of a man of Macedonia. This is the region of Macedonia, all of this right here. Now, when you hear the word Macedonia, what you should hear in your mind is Eastern Europe. This is what we would call modern-day Greece. The, this man from Macedonia says, come over and help us. Preach the gospel to us. And for those of you who come from a European background, this should matter to you. This is the gospel. This is the, the gospel, a, pl- a church plant happening for the first time in Europe. So Paul, the text says, hears this vision, sees this vision in Troas. And so from Troas, we put out to sea and we sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day, we went on to Neapolis. And from there, we traveled to Philippi a Roman colony, the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Again, you have all of these names, all of these uh, cities. So they go from Troas, they put out to sea, and they pass by this little island called Samothrace, pass on by, they land here at Neapolis, and then they travel on to Philippi, which is the main city in that region of Macedonia. And whenever we see a text like this, I always like to point out, like, we can read it and they're just kind of, they're just cities and buzzwords and we we don't understand what they mean and we just kind of want to skip right over them. But I always like to stop at this point and remind us all that these are real places with real people in a real, in a real time. Like this didn't happen in Narnia. 
This, is, this didn't happen in Neverland. This was not, this was not uh, set in Wakanda or Oz, all right? These are real people in real places at real times. So Paul and his companions make it finally to Philippi. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and we began to speak to the women who had gathered there. So Paul gets to Philippi. And again, Philippi is a Roman colony. Sabbath comes around. Paul's normal mode would, of preaching the gospel is whenever he'd show up to a city, he'd always start by preaching in the synagogue. He would always go and try to preach to his people first. Apparently, though, in Philippi, there is no synagogue because he doesn't go to the synagogue. In fact, to establish a synagogue in a city, you needed 10 married Jewish men. But apparently they didn't have that. Again, this is a Roman colony. These are Gentiles. This is a Gentile city. There's not enough Jews there to establish a synagogue. Because as soon as you had 10, any good Jew, they're setting up a synagogue. But they didn't because there wasn't enough. And so if there was not a synagogue in a city, God-fearing Jews or converts to Judaism would establish a place of prayer. And most often they would do it beside a river. And so Paul knew this, so when the Sabbath comes, he goes outside the city, he and his cohorts, and they start walking down the river looking for people who would be spending the Sabbath praying. And he finds them. And the text says he sits down and begins to teach the women there. I think it's interesting uh, that when Paul had a vision, he saw a vision of a man from Macedonia. But when he shows up to Philippi, it's women who are there actually seeking God. So Paul takes his posture as a teacher. He sits down. That's what you do in the synagogue. The teacher sits, and he begins to teach the women there. So that's, what he's, that's, that's how this thing begins. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So Paul sits there and he's teaching. And as he's teaching, one of the people listening was a woman named Lydia. And the text says she's from Thyatira, which is in Asia Minor. So apparently she's got a couple of houses. She's doing some business in Philippi because she is a dealer of purple cloth. Now, what you need to know about that is means she's rich. She's dealing with rich people. She's got a rich clientele. Purple cloth was super expensive. The way you got purple dye in the ancient world was literally you would take snails. There was some snails that had some dye. You wring out a few drops from the snails. It took thousands of snails to get one piece of cloth dyed purple, which is why it is the rural color. Because it was super expensive. Not everybody could do this. That's the only way you can get the color purple was from these snails. And they were from, these snails were abundant in Thyatira. So she's a dealer in that. She would create these and then ship them out and go around into a big city like Philippi. She would find some clientele. So she is a wealthy woman. She is a powerful woman. She has influence. She has clout. She is, she, she's like a CEO of a, 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 a fashionista industry here of her own making. That's, that's Lydia. It's here we find her. She's out here and Paul is preaching, he's sharing the good news about Jesus. The text says she is a worshiper of God. She's a God worshiper. But even though she is a worshiper of God, there was something missing for Lydia. There there was something that she didn't get that God wanted her to get. Because as, God, as Paul is speaking to her, look what it says. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. There was something that she didn't understand. And as Paul begins to speak, God opens her heart. A light bulb goes off for her. And she got it. And when Paul shares about Jesus, when she comes to believe in Jesus as her Lord, 
She responds to Paul's message. So how do you respond to the message? Well, the text says she and her whole household were baptized. That's how she responded. She gets the message about who Jesus is and she responds. And I can't help but think that there might be some Lydia's among us today. Some men and women who are here, who are watching at home, and you would consider yourself a God worshiper. I wonder if there's, if Paul would have walked up to Lydia that day and say, hey, do you believe in God? What do you think she would have said? Of course I believe in God. That's why I'm here. It's the Sabbath. I'm out here praying today. Of course I believe in God. I think if you'd ask Lydia, Lydia, how, how do you feel about your relationship with God? Ah, I don't know. I think it's pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get to know him. I'm not sure about all of it, but I'm, I'm here. I think we're good. But again, there was something that she was missing. She was missing, and the Lord opened her heart. And when Paul shared about who Jesus is, that it isn't just enough to believe in God, but that God had sent his son to die in your place for your sin. You are a sinner, and you need a Savior, and God sent it in his son, and he, he died for you so that through his death and his burial and his resurrection, you can actually die to yourself and be buried with him in baptism in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, you too can be raised to new life. And as she heard that, the light bulbs went off and immediately she looks at Paul and says, then let's do that now, here, today. And she and her whole household are baptized because the Lord opened her heart to respond to the message. Because being baptized is, is the first and most natural response to believing the good news about Jesus. In fact, it is so natural that it's almost written in as an afterthought. Look at this text. It says, The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. It's almost in passing that it tells us, Oh, yeah, she, of course she was baptized. Of course. Because that's what you do when you come to believe. And so she says to these guys, So now, if you consider me a believer... If you believe that God just now brought me into the family, then come and stay at my house. Which again, just points to her wealth, her ability to take these people into her home. It shows that she's a person of means with a home big enough to care for these men and to provide for their needs. And in this moment, Lydia becomes the first convert to Jesus in Philippi. But she's not the only one. Once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are the servants of the most high God who, is who are telling you the way to be saved. So Luke, who's recording this for us, says, look, we're walking around and, and this slave girl, this slave woman is following us. And they're just, she's just shouting this over and over. These men are the servants of the Most High God who are telling us the way to be saved. And when you think about this female, female slave, you need to picture like the exact opposite of Lydia, okay? Where Lydia is powerful, this woman has no power. Where Lydia has clout, she has no clout. She's a slave. Where Lydia's in control, she's like a CEO of a, of a fashion company. This woman has no control. She is possessed by a spirit. This woman is the exact opposite. She has no wealth. She has no money. She has no revenue stream. In fact, she is the revenue stream for those who are her captors. The Greek, in the Greek, there's a word here, and she has this spirit. It's called a python spirit. It was a spirit that, again, helped her share the future, which, again, made her owners a lot of money. Because in this very superstitious, superstitious culture, there's not a general, there's not a commander, there's not a, a tycoon business guy who's going to risk anything without first going to visit some kind of diviner to see if this 
is going to work. So they would pay a lot of money to have her tell the, tell the future. She is a cash cow for her owners. And so she begins following Paul and the other companions with him, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which that sounds like a good thing, right? Like this woman's given good free publicity. But actually in a Greco-Roman world where there are hundreds of deities, hundreds of gods, this phrase, uh, servants of the Most High God, this was used of Zeus. This actually becomes confusing for people. They just assume that she's hollering about one of the many other gods. There's lots of gods and lots of saviors, and she's just yelling about another one that gets added to the number. It actually becomes uh, uh, distracting to the message that Paul is trying to proclaim, that Jesus is a one and only. And so she begins to follow them around, shouting this. And she kept this up for many days. How many days? I don't know, two days, three days, five days, seven days, nine days, but over and over for day after day after day. Finally, Paul became so annoyed, to which I'm so grateful that our scriptures just call it how it is. I love it that the scripture puts that in there. He just got annoyed. He's just so sick of it. Day after day after day, this woman behind him screaming this, he turns around and he says to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. Paul finally had enough. Urgh, so annoyed. Come out in the name of Jesus. And the spirit left her. Now, there's a little bit of play on words in the original language that we miss here in the Greek, but I think it's great. Luke, who's writing this down, uses the same word where it says, in that moment, the Spirit left her. He uses the same word to describe the hope of making money was gone. It's the same word in the Greek, a little play on words. He said, when the money, or sorry, when the Spirit was gone, the money was gone. When the Spirit left, their money left. It was gone. They were connected. Luke connects the dot. When the spirit left, their money left. And they realized, oh no, our cash cow just dried up. And they are angry. And so they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. After being drug in, you can read the text. They get drug before the magistrates and the, the owners of this girl trump up some false charges against Paul and Silas. They rally the whole crowd against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates just give in in the moment. And they have Paul and Silas stripped of their clothes and beaten with rods. That's what the Romans did. They would just take a big stick and just whack, 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 beaten Paul and Silas. Backs are bloodied and they're whipped and they're dragged away. And the magistrates say, now, they go throw them in the jail. And the jailer takes them and throws them in what we would call the dungeon, the middle of the jail. And they're placed in stocks, the text says. Now, when you hear stocks, don't think of like, you know, 17th century New England. All right, that's not what he's doing. The Romans like to hurt people. They're good at causing pain. And so when they lock you in stocks, the point was to contort your body, to twist your body in very uncomfortable ways, to stretch you out and to lock you into this very uncomfortable position so that your body actually spasms, creates cramping in your body, and you can't move to fix it. That was what happened to Paul and Silas in this Philippian jail. Some of you may remember the rest of the story. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all of the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. So after being falsely accused, beaten with rods, thrown into jail, Paul and Silas at midnight are singing and praising God from the jail. And, and I read that and I think, 
I don't believe that would probably be my response in this moment. I mean, what if Paul and Silas said they've only done exactly what God has wanted? Why would God let this happen to them? But yet here they are and they're singing and they're praising God and all of the prisoners are just listening to them, no doubt blown away. I can't imagine that would be my response. I mean, the reality is I have difficulty praising God when my internet is slow and I'm trying to stream a movie. I mean, that's... I can't imagine being in their position, but here they are singing praises to God. And when they do, God shows up and he breaks them free. An earthquake comes and shakes and all the doors fly open and all the chains drop down and they're free. The jailer woke up. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul himself, but I'm sorry, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. God sets them free, shakes the doors open, drops their chains. The jailer wakes up from the earthquake. He runs into the jail. All the doors are open. All the chains are broken. He's like, oh man, I'm in trouble. Because he was responsible. And if any one of these prisoners escaped, it would be his life at stake. In fact, uh, if you go back in your Bible to Acts chapter 12, God broke Peter out of prison in Acts chapter 12. You may remember that story. And Peter gets out. And there were two guards who were supposed to be guarding Peter. And when they found Peter in the, the courtyard of the temple, the two guards that were supposed to be guarding him were murdered by the Romans. They were put to death because of it. Well, this Philippian jailer, he isn't having that. He's like, no, the Romans just like to hurt people. If, if I'm going to die today, I'm going to die at my hands, not theirs. So he sees the doors open. He grabs his sword, sticks it to his stomach, and he's about to take the Lipton plunge right on top of his sword. When Paul shouts out, don't harm yourself. We're here. We're not going anywhere. To which, again, I read this and I think, I'm not sure I would have the capacity to to do that. If I were Paul, I might just let him do it. (laughs) I mean, because seriously, think about this for a second. Who knows, this jailer may have been the one that was doing the beating. For sure it was this jailer who put him in the stocks and has been torturing him for the last however many hours. I mean, if if this guy dies today because of his sin, maybe he's just getting what he deserves. But that's not the way Paul thought. Paul said, we all are broke free, but we're not going anywhere. Don't kill yourself. The jailer called for lights. He rushed in and he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and he asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. They come and say, the jailer like, what do I have to do to to have what you have? How can I experience what you are experiencing right now? I don't get it. What do I have to do? And it says that very night they shared the word of the Lord. God loves you. You're a sinner and you need a savior. But he sent his son to die in your place and for your sin. You don't have to die. Jesus has died for you. And he was buried and he was raised up. And because he broke death, you can break death. They preached the word to this jailer in the middle of the night. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, the very wounds that he himself probably created. He washes their wounds. And then immediately he and, his, and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. In the middle of the night, Paul shares the gospel. And how does he respond? How does he respond? With repentance. 
That's what the washing of these wounds, that's an act of repentance. Providing a meal for them, that's an act of repentance. He knew what he had done is wrong and he makes it right. And immediately, the text says, immediately, he and his whole household were baptized in the middle of the night. I understand the gospel. I have come to believe in God. So baptize me now. I'm in. I'm in. And that's what Paul does. Because that's what you do when you come to faith. When you understand the gospel and you come to believe, that's what you do. You believe, you repent, and you are baptized. So the Philippian jailer becomes a brother to Paul and Silas. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1. Paul's writing this letter. It's been 10 years since he walked out of that jail in Philippi. And he's writing back this letter. And Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. What's he remembering? He's remembering showing up into Philippi and walking down the Gang Knights River. He remembers seeing these women sharing the gospel and watching the light bulb go off for Lydia. He remembers walking her out and baptizing her right there that day. He remembers that woman, that slave woman who followed him around and annoyed him for day after day after day. And he turns around. He remembers the moment when that spirit left her and no doubt the spirit of God replaced that python spirit in her life. That was 10 years ago. I wonder what her life looks like now as Paul's writing this letter. He remembers getting stripped and beaten by the magistrates there in Philippi. He remembers being contorted, yet singing praises to God. He remembers how God showed up, shook the jail, and set him free. But it turns out Paul wasn't the one who needed to be set free that night. His chains fell off, but you know who else had chains fall off? The Philippian jailer. This Roman soldier who had no idea that there was even a God he needed to bow down to. But he surrendered it all that night at the, at the hands of, of Paul being baptized with his family. When Paul says, I remember you. These aren't just nameless, faceless people to Paul. These are people that he knows and that he loves this isn't just kind of some theological treaties that we have here in this book. Although it is that for us, this is a heartfelt letter of love from a pastor to his people. And I hope that as we read it, that's the lens that we see it through. Let me, let me end today with this. In the first century... Um, there was a prayer that almost every Jewish man would pray every day. And the prayer went like this. Lord, thank you that you did not make me a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. You should add that to your prayers. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Good Jewish men, this is the prayer they would pray. Because in their, in their mindset, in their cultural paradigm... All of these were second class. A Jewish man was above all of them. All the rest of these, a woman, a Gentile, a slave, they're all second class. They don't get a seat at the table like I do. They're not part of the family like I am. And yet when we think about, we think about the church of Philippi, how did it begin? It began with a woman named Lydia, a slave woman set free, and a Gentile soldier, the jailer, coming to know Jesus. And in this picture of the start of the church of Philippi, we get this amazing promise that all of us get a chance to be a part of the family, to be a part of the ecclesia, to be a part of what God's trying to accomplish in the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ 
who died in our place and for our sins through repentance and confession and baptism, we get to be brought into the family just like Lydia and just like the jailer. I don't know what you walked in with today. I don't know if you, if you consider yourself a religious person or not, but here's the question I have. Have you responded? Have you responded to the good news? Not just do you believe it, have you responded like Lydia, like the jailer? Recognize your need to not just believe that there is a God, but to surrender to a Savior named Jesus. And again, the way that we do that, the most natural response is to confess Jesus is Lord, repent of your sins, and be baptized. And maybe you're sitting here thinking, well, I'm not prepared for that. My guess is Lydia did not walk down to that river that day thinking she was going to take a dip. And my guess is, is that Philippian jailer showed up that, to work that night. He was not planning on washing the wounds of one of his prisoners and then letting him baptize him in the river. But they did it. Why? Because that's what you do when you come to believe. So I don't know where you are today. But I want to give you a chance to respond. If you're ready today, if you've come to believe, then put your belief into action by responding to the gospel, to be baptized. At the end of our service today, we're going to have our prayer team members down at the, under the cross by the baptistry. And if you want to do that today, we're ready for you to give you a chance to respond to the good news of Jesus, to be a part of the ecclesia of God. That includes a Gentile Philippian jailer and a fashionista named Lydia. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word that does not leave us wondering what we're supposed to do. You tell us. We believe. We repent. We're we're to be baptized. And when we do that, just like Jesus, we are dead and buried and raised to life again we get to experience that. And so my prayer right now is that just as you did for Lydia beside that river, that you would open the hearts of those in this room who need to respond. Do your work among your people today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.